I thought that people would just see it as this really geeky thing and just make fun of it. And I think that hasn't really happened because we kind of make fun of ourselves. We take it seriously in, on one level, but also it is a bunch of uh, self-deprecating weirdos like me, I guess. around the world trying to answer this question um, there's lots of conferences about this question for me live coding is just writing and executing code live typically used to refer to people making audio or making visuals um, commonly in like an algorithm type setting but there are other settings as well which I'm also very excited about it's not just about making dance music and techno um, there's lots of cool experimental stuff going on Live coding kind of started or is focused around um, the top lap community. And then there's this manifesto which says things like uh, open processes and open minds and like show people your screens and uh, you know don't hide behind a black box of technology basically and I think that's quite like a, a fun and important aspect of live coding is that it's designed to be quite open it's designed to be quite democratic I've been involved in live coding for about 19 years. Over that time, I've organized lots of events. I've made various live coding systems, hundreds of performances in different places, festivals around the world. Co-founded lots of things like Algorave and TopLap, both live coding communities. So yeah, I've been involved for a while. Live coding was um, a strong scene, but there was a lot of noise music, lots of electroacoustic music, um, experimental improv, which I also love, but um, I wanted to be part of a dance music scene. Um, and uh, it seems uh, that coming up with a name for it uh, really helped. It was um, me and Nick Collins. We were um, on the way to a gig in Nottingham and tuned into the pirate radio station and started talking about the kind of music we wanted to make that night and decided to try and make happy hardcore sort of old school rave music. I think the word algorave came out of that journey. It's spread to 90 different cities now. Anyone can make an algorave. There are some guidelines. There's no IP, it's not protected in any way. Anyone can make an algorave. And I really like the idea of forming a community that really focused on the algorithms as being um, uh, sort of uh, the dominant mode of expression, I guess. For me, I find it a really sort of like interesting, like uh, public expression of uh, what algorithms are and what they can do. I, I think an algorithm musically for me is a way of engaging with computer music. And the other thing I think about when I think about algorithms as well is how they are man-made and how they are biased. For me, I guess like the tangible part is like the output of the algorithm. So, you know, it could be, oh, I create an algorithm to create a baseline, or it could be that, you know, there's Russian spies creating algorithms to make people vote in an election in a certain way. It's something that you can approach and like um, gain some understanding of like what it's doing and how it's functioning, even if you don't fully understand like the syntax that's doing that. You remove the, the graphic user interface and it, you still have an interface, but 
that interface is a bit harder to use until you get used to it, but it's a lot more powerful for manipulating sounds. It's so easy for people to, to write a little bit of code and to instantly hear the difference and instantly be like, oh, I changed that and now it sounds like this. In live coding, um, the algorithmic aspect of the music is really kind of uh, visible. Obviously, we project it behind us. Um, so it's, it kind of becomes part of the music, the kind of underlying structure of it. Um, sort of expressed in this formal language. It takes away a lot of the magic of the black box, right? Of like pushing the button and it, hit, and it plays. I don't know if that's direct access to the machine. It's just kind of changing the way that we access the machine to look more of a musical way. Part of your decision as a composer or someone who makes music, um, choosing what instruments you use, what tools you use, is a part of the creative you know, it affects the output as much as um, the actual notes that you choose to play. Actually, programming can be a creative act. If you use a tool that relies on code like Super Collider or Tidal, it lets you get to the, the kind of centre of things, really, and really manipulate things, and in that way it becomes really expressive. Live coding is different from sort of standard computer programming because it is so accessible. Like, I've never really used any sort of code, don't consider myself a coder really. You have these abstractions, but are the same abstraction, they're musical abstractions. So if you can understand music, then you can understand how to live code music. I think you have more freedom and flexibility to decide for yourself how you're going to use the tool. It's easy to get off the grid with something like Tidal Cycles, although you're kind of always locked into a grid, but you can, um, you can do things very quickly and easily with randomization and different pattern lengths. Tidal, um, I think, is all about pattern. So that's in terms of um, repetition, so just repeating patterns. Um, symmetry, so um, where you reflect things, so they go forwards and backwards or rotate them. Um, uh, if they're cyclic patterns or interference patterns where you get different elements and combine them in strange ways um, and also uh, where you have glitches in the pattern where you set, set up a certain expectation which is then broken. You know you have a lot more control and a lot more freedom of expression. And people who have never done programming before come along to my workshops and we can get them making music together in a couple of hours. It's not a competitive scene and I think it's a really community minded scene. I think because you have people like Joanne um, and like Alex McLean who are working really hard to grow the scene, you kind of get people interested in live coding and to teach people and they do a lot of work bringing new people in. Alex particularly organises lots of gigs and lots of events and he's always will make space for newcomers and wants newcomers to feel welcome and not to feel like afraid to play a show or that there's a lot of judgment on them playing their first show. And I think because that ethos has kind of come so strongly across with people like Alex, it then perpetuates because like I was in that position myself. So now I understand like if I'm organizing a show or I meet someone who's new and interested, I'm like, oh yeah, come along because I want to support them because that's how I was supported to, to get to where I am. I don't see it as a necessity at all to be a live coding performer. You have to be an academic or like have an academic background. I think it's just that's where the critical mass is right now and how people are sort of finding out about live coding. We formed the Top Plat um, organization in 2004, I think, um, and wrote that um, draft manifesto. Um, we were all students. Um, that was in uh, Hamburg in Germany. Um, and, and since then, um, people have got sort of jobs and become professors and things. So it's funny thinking about this sort of meeting of students. Eventually, uh, everyone's now grown up. It's born of research, which is why it has links to academia, because um, you know, there'll be people in computing departments and computer music departments that are kind of um, uh, generating a lot of the ideas behind this kind of stuff.
in type reuse software built by um, my bandmate Ryan, but he's doing that as part of a PhD. So his PhD is about um, collaboration in music and how people uh, communicate while they're improvising. And you know that's why he's created this software that gives us ways of doing that. So without Ryan doing his PhD, I doubt he would have been able to focus to create that software for us to use. I mean, there are plenty of people in the live coding scene who are not academics as well, or like not working in academia. One thing I've also noticed about that in like different live coding, like sort of forums online, um, particularly the Rocket Chat, is like people like often complain about that. They're like, well, live coding's academic, um, which I, I don't know exactly know what they mean by that, first of all, because um, yes, I'm an academic, but I'm an artist first. I'm in favour of trying to get people in who are maybe musicians um, or interested more in sound. I think um, having lots of academics involved um, isn't the best way of doing it. I mean, so we have a kind of academic bubble, but I think our grave has burst out of that in, a, in many ways. I think if it's going to be like a legitimate music scene or way of making music, it needs to break out of academia. Um, I think it has the potential to like offer lots of different people an interesting way of making music. And I think if it stays in academia, it's a bit of a waste of that. So I think that freedom that you get in, in the university doing research degrees and things is, is really key. People do make really experimental work because um, that probably wouldn't be financially viable. Um, outside of academia. You don't have the same kind of social security which you used to do <laughs> in the kind of heyday of uh, the sort of uh, 60s to 80s when uh, people were just, yeah, yeah, being a musician and being an artist was uh, much more accessible. At the moment, it's a scene that's sustained a lot just by people's individual energy. Um, it's not a sustainable scene economically. I guess there's always a bit of a, a balance between uh, making something totally accessible and free, but it means that someone else has had to provide their labour for free to en enable that to happen. I haven't really ever had a problem with um, making it open source. It's, um, it's always been available. Um, and all the software I use is free open source software. So it's not really something I even thought about. It's just something you do is just upload it and share it because all the software you're using is free, so why not share your own? It's not like, you know, Pro Tools that you pay X amount of money for or whatever, whatever software you're going to use. So there's no money coming in from that side of it. And people, unfortunately, do need money. We live in a capitalist society, right? You have to pay your rent, you have to eat. I mean, this is the problem, I think, um, all art faces. Like, how do you make it sustainable? I think people uh, do this for love, not money. And I think passion's a really dangerous thing because people can become burnt out. Like if you're doing a lot through passion, there becomes an expectation that you'll do it for passion, but that doesn't pay the bills, right? I know Alex has a kind of something similar to a Patreon account or something to support Tidal, which I haven't donated to, which I probably should do as I use it quite often now. Because it is free software, people are happy to pay more for workshops, I think. Um, so I can do a workshop on a weekend that um, sort of covers me sort of a week or two's worth of free software development. One of the reasons I wanted to start live coding was just to give me more options as an improviser in terms of like what kind of music I can make. For me, live coding is about not having the perfect bit of code that makes a really nice loop. It's more about how you get there and it's kind of about the build up and how you transition from one thing to another. I don't prepare any of the code. I just think about where I want to go in that time slot. I just feel safer starting with something. I, I don't like starting with a blank screen. I always start writing my sound making code at the start of the set and I just go with whatever happens or like try and respond to the audience or respond to my collaborator. More and more I prepare less. Uh, I used to prepare more when I was kind of learning to do this. 
And I'm also getting kind of like, you know, well-paid shows and traveling across different continents. Um, I can see I can see those pressures and I feel them. I've got a performance coming up in Glastonbury Festival in a couple of weeks and it's like a 90 minute performance. And I think actually um, life cutting from scratch for 90, pe- 90 minutes in front of uh, a huge crowd, I think is, is just too, too much. Idealistically, I think pre-writing your sets is kind of boring. Yeah, I love that to go up on stage and I don't know what I'm going to do. And once you start, that's it. You're there. You're there for half an hour, however long your set is. The audience is there. You've got the PA. Everything's coming out really loud and you can just enjoy yourself. It's nice that you can take risks, uh, not just technically, but aesthetically as well. If I ride a reverb um, and I've had too many zeros in it, I can crash my system. Experiments uh, go wrong by their nature or turn out differently than you think. You know, if something goes wrong, just own it. Like repeat it four times and the people think it's it's how it's meant to be you know there's nothing worse than going and watching a band just play their songs and they sound exactly the same as the album i had a performance like quite recently actually where like so many things went wrong it was like ridiculous but i don't know the audience didn't seem to mind but it was like a bit of a like um theatrical coding melodrama i quite like those moments in music where something does go wrong and you see the performer respond to that and kind of pick up and either bring it into the music or kind of uh, work around it in some way. You know, you go to a gig and you see like Alex McLean and he makes a mistake or his software doesn't work quite right and you feel like, well, actually, it's kind of it has a levelling effect and you're like, well, you know, if, if, if something goes wrong for him, then it doesn't matter if it goes wrong for me. Live coding improvised is um, much more about just trying something out and see where it goes. Um, and then it's not so much about um, finding something that's good or bad, but rather steering it into somewhere um, that ultimately is going to be good. The kind of music you do here is so, so broad anyway. I don't think there's a sound of Algorave. Women still face a lot of prejudice in society, particularly around technology, particularly around music. There's just a lot more like active movement in the live coding scene to um, encourage women to um, be part of it and be proactive about including women in the scene, making sure that it's a comfortable place to be. But I still don't think we're at a place where we can you know, like pat ourselves on the back and say, great, our scene is gender neutral. Live coding is still pretty male dominated on an international level and in terms of the forums and stuff. Yeah, it takes organizers to like actually stand up and say, we have to like, we have to like be aware of this and make sure we have a diversity policy. I mean, in terms of like electronic music, um, Algorithm wants to differentiate itself as kind of a welcoming scene to women. But I, you know, I've spoken to women who've had like experiences that don't necessarily um, complement that. Um, not from live coders, but from like audiences. People come to a Tidal Club and tell me they've never seen Tidal before and they're trying to explain to me how it works. Like, I literally organise the event. And, and it happens all the time to women, not just in live coding, but all women working with technology and, and computer code. If you're literally live coding, people can't really be questioning whether you wrote the code yourself or not, because which is something that happens. What they serve to do is just place women in a space where they can't where they you know can't be imagined to be effective at using technology if you look back even further historically a lot of programmers were women but yeah that's been sort of like erased and um deleted from the history as much as possible and we're only just coming back now to (laughs) sort of like rewriting those histories you're always questioning yourself like oh would i be getting this treatment if i was a man and you never know the answer to that question but you know you you kind of learn these patterns of behavior. We've had people come to our female-only workshops who have like said things like they didn't think they could ever code or they tried coding but then decided that it wasn't something that they could do. When I do women-only workshops, they often sell out. When I do 
um, workshops open to anyone. There's hardly ever women. There's often hardly any women or non-binary people there. Lucy Cheeseman, who performs as heavy lifting, and Doreen Champard performs as Belisha Beacon. They both came to our first women-only live coding workshop, um, and they're, now they're like you know performing super regularly as live coding performers which is awesome to talk differently about what code is and what code means and who can code can you know affect small change in local communities but i think it's uh, yeah and i think it's more than that reaching out to different audiences and approaching people about the workshop and work that you're doing and encouraging people to get involved who you might not expect to want to get involved <laughs> Me and Alex and Jaram went to Japan last year and played some shows out there. Like, it blew my mind to be able to like go to Japan to play music. Beyond a dream come true. I just was talking to a guy in like a shopping centre and he's like, oh, what are you doing here? You're a tourist. And I was like, oh, I'm actually a musician. I've come to play some shows. He was like, wow, you must be so famous. <laughs> to about three people, maybe. Because it's a small scene, it's like, you know, if somebody in Japan wants to book somebody from the UK, well, they haven't got that many people to choose from. I get lucky, it could be me. It's not like there's thousands of people doing it. It's been uh, pushing for the last couple of years, like a little bit more towards mainstream uh, and especially with the sort of bigger press we've had, Guardian and Times. Particularly in Word magazine, every every few years there's a new article saying that it's the future. I think live coding as a performance practice in the sense that you write code and see where it goes and explore it through performance and go on that journey with the audience. I think that's going to have a limited appeal to people. I don't know if that's necessarily like the future will be, we'll all go to Algorays. The future is live coders will be in these lineups with other electronic musicians. Live coding as like a kind of process for like making music versus live coding as a way of performing and a way of like being with music um, and exploring music and sharing music with an audience will separate out. You get live coders um, touring the world now, like Renick Bell, who uh, perform all over the place. Sometimes they're Algrays, most of the times they're not. I guess it just, it doesn't become Algrave anymore. It just becomes electronic music. I think that's more interesting when like live coding is just like another approach amongst many um, to get people up and dancing. I want Algrave to be a wonky space for people to like make terrible music in if they want. The roots of the scene are in experimentalism and I, I don't think that'll change. The accessibility of technology and of the software now could potentially lead on to lots of exciting things happening. Also live coding itself developing and becoming more hybrid sort of with again mixing live coding interfaces with graphical interfaces and physical in interfaces so it becomes much richer in a way. I think whether Algorave and live coding goes into mainstream dance music or not, I think this this kind of scene like today will still carry on regardless. So I'm interested to see where it goes next. You'll probably find me in a year's time recording the traffic outside, playing it backwards on my speaker, shouting into a microphone. No one cares, but you know, I'm fine with that as well. I'm not in it for any kind of material success. Right now, I'm mostly working on my programming language for uh, choreography. The tip of the iceberg is sort of done with that, like enough to make a performance, <laughs> but there's still tons of work to do. We have this uh, Mimic project, Life Coding Language, which we're working on at the University of Sussex. What it's going to be is an online tool where you can live code music in a web browser. I have a friend who's a saxophonist. I work on a performance with her where I'm using what she's playing to generate code and music that then I can sort of interact with in real time. Musically, mainly techno. Getting really into making nice, predictable techno with my friend Sam as classical plant audio interfaces. TCAI. That's really fun. Playing a bit less, traveling a bit less. I'm going in a few weeks to Orkney. A close collaborator of mine, Amy Beeston, has moved there. I'm going to go and spend a week with her. We're making some sound art together. I'll be developing this life coding language, which should come out a bit later this year. It's kind of like a meta language. This is a system that will let you design your own personalized life coding language. I'm going to New York. I'm going to a conference there, doing a live coding performance with some collaborators in Australia. 
I'm also playing an Algar over there. Developing an album. Then I have another gig, two gigs in London. Making another album. Do more workshops with younger people. I'm really interested in the idea of algorithmically generated like auto-tune and vocoder. I don't really have a big plan right now. I know, I have too many ideas. Algrave hasn't been around that long, but um, yeah, I've been doing similar things for um, since the year 2000. So at this point, I think if, uh, if I'm not the present of music, then I don't know when I ever will be. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it now you know it's uh, it's it's of the time and um, it probably won't be happening still in 10 years time but that's all fine um someone else will do something equally strange hopefully